For the first time in more than 20 years, there's fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan in the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh. Azerbaijan has now declared a ceasefire, but what triggered the violence and what impact will it have? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, some have called it a frozen conflict, a long-standing dispute between Azerbaijan and Armenia over the region of Nagorno-Karabakh. But fighting that began on Saturday is threatening to destabilise the region. At least 30 soldiers have been killed from both sides, making this the worst violence since a 1994 truce ended a war in which Armenian-backed forces seized the territory from Azerbaijan. Now, the region of Nagorno-Karabakh, marked here in yellow, is predominantly ethnic Armenian and placed under Azerbaijan control in 1922 by the then Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. The Armenian population of this mountainous, landlocked enclave began a push for unification with Armenia. As the Soviet Union broke up, a full-scale war began in 1991. The Armenians took control of Nagorno-Karabakh in 1994 after the deaths of around 30,000 people. And this shaded area around Nagorno-Karabakh is the so-called buffer zone, which is controlled by Armenian forces, but claimed by Azerbaijan. Well, the crisis has the potential to spread, pulling in the big regional players. That's why diplomatic efforts have continued since the ceasefire of 1994. The main peace effort involves the so-called Minsk Group, which is co-chaired by the US, Russia and France. And it's part of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. Now, they're expected to meet again on Tuesday in Vienna, but the group isn't entirely neutral. Turkey, which is part of the Minsk group, has voiced wholehearted support for Azerbaijan, and Russia sells arms to both parties. We can bring in our guests now. Joining us in London is Daniel Hamilton, political commentator on Eastern Europe and South Caucasus affairs. In Moscow, we have Sergei Strokin, political commentator at the daily newspaper Commissant. And also in London, on Skype, is Marcus Papadopoulos, editor of Politics First magazine. Welcome to you all. OK, can uh, I start with you then, Daniel, with uh, this term, frozen conflict, which is bandied about rather often with regard to the conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh. It's far from frozen, isn't it? Well, precisely. I think the, the only reason that there is so much media coverage over the last couple of days about the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh is this unprecedented flare-up where we've seen incursions by Azeri shelling into Nagorno-Karabakh villages and a very, very high casualty number both on the Armenian and the Azeri side. But in reality, this is a conflict which has raged on for many years. Assassinations by snipers are a daily reality on both sides of the conflict line. And whilst this may be getting international attention now, this is a live, festering and potentially quite explosive conflict, which is far from frozen. And Sergei in Moscow, uh, the timing of this is interesting when both leaders uh, were attending the Nuclear Security Summit in Washington, D.C. Uh, absolutely. I, I think this is one of the uh, crucial points. The timing of the statement is very important. And uh, uh, the eruption of hostilities, uh, we witnessed the eruption of hostilities just 24 hours after President Aliyev had a high-profile meeting with State Secretary Kerry and uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, let me refer to the statements on Nagorno-Karabakh, which were made in Washington at the joint, uh, joint press sta statements by President Aliyev and uh, State Secretary uh, Kerry. So uh, that, uh, that this, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, issue needs speedy resolution. And also what is important, uh, I was watching carefully the developments uh, in recent weeks. Uh, President Aliyev uh, made uh, quite a number of important statements. Unfortunately, they were bypassed by international media, where he used quite a strong language and uh, was showing his growing impatience over the impasse 
which the world is seeing in Nagorno-Karabakh issue. So if you just analyze all the string of the events, and you see this all of a sudden, why Az Azeri army uh, uh, went into an offensive, you'll see a certain logic in that. To, to, to sum it up, it seems that uh, by, by just uh, exercising this uh, uh, blitz offensive, uh, Azerbaijan has sent the world a clear signal that it will not tolerate the status of frozen conflict. It is not interested in the status quo which we have seen in more than two decades. That uh, it wants the world to uh, set in motion the political process which is currently defunct due to the inactivity of Minsk group which, which is working under the auspice of OSCE. And uh, Marcus, why do you think this moment has provided the opportunity for the Azerbaijan government to push uh, for a resolution of, of some character or other to the situation which has lied pretty much dormant uh, for 20 years, as we've said? Why now? Well, I think it's also no coincidence that in the last week or so, um, a number of uh, lobby groups in Washington have taken up, uh, have taken on Turkey as a client. And of course, Turkey is um, heavily lobbying the American government, arguing that uh, Russia, uh, through Armenia, poses a direct threat, a direct threat to uh, Turkey. And of course, Turkey is a NATO uh, member state. Turkey um, has very, very close uh, political, military and cultural relations with Azerbaijan. Turkey doesn't even recognize Armenia as an independent sovereign country and remember Turkey borders uh, Armenia. So in my mind, in my estimation, I believe it is very likely that the hand of Ankara has played a part in what we have seen over the last 48 hours in Nagorno-Karabakh, i.e. an eruption um, of hostilities. And of course, it's welcome news today that uh, Azerbaijan has unilaterally declared a ceasefire. But Turkey's role in this must be emphasised. And uh, would you agree with that, Daniel? Would you agree that uh, this could be a continuation of the hostilities that we've seen deepening uh, between Russia and Turkey, particularly over Syria? I think that's a factor, but I think there's a couple of other points that also need to be addressed. I think the first is the domestic, political and economic situation in Azerbaijan itself. Uh, the Aliyev regime has, over the last 20 years, been able to spend extremely generously on pensions, on large-scale public infrastructure projects and so on. But with the collapse in the global oil price, that largesse is being put at significant risk. So I think that's the first point I would make. There is a need for the Aliyev regime to domestically show that they are still strong, they're still in control, and by engaging further on Nagorno-Karabakh, it's a nice way of diverting attention away from some of those domestic issues that Azerbaijan faces. I think the second point is also one which you addressed in your introductory remarks, which is very much connected with Russia. Now, of course, there is a situation on the ground by which Azerbaijan is broadly seen as falling into the Turkish orbit, whereas Armenia is seen as being aligned to Russia. But in reality, Russia is selling arms to both parties, and it serves Russia extremely well to ensure that there is tension between Azerbaijan and Armenia to mean that neither side can plough really their own independent foreign policy inside the region. In, in respect of the, the ongoing conflict between, between Russia and Turkey, there of course is a part to play here, but I think it's extremely important to recognise that on the ground this is a situation that Russia has been feeding for many decades. There's nothing really all that okay. new there. Let's put in, that in, a, in, a, in a final point, which I must also address uh, okay. just in relation to the ceasefire. Um, of course, it's the, one of the other panellists has mentioned that a ceasefire has been declared. Uh, there's actually no evidence on the ground, and I've spoken to those in Nagorno-Karabakh within the last hour, and shelling continues to take place in Martuni province in the north of Nagorno-Karabakh. So whilst there are all sorts of press statements flying around, whilst there are claims being made by the Azeri side that there has been a cessation in violence, there continues to be shelling. So there certainly has not been a ceasefire. It seems to me to be a negotiating tactic. All right, tactic. well, let's, let's put some of those points to Sergei in Moscow. What does Russia want? As uh, Daniel just suggested, Sergei, does this benefit, the status quo, does this benefit Russia? Russia, as we know, has invested heavily militarily within the South Caucasus and, of course, economically. So is it within Russia's interest to keep this conflict going? Well, I would put it this way. For Russia, this is a delicate balancing act 
because on one hand we have to keep in mind that Russia is one of the chairman or, or uh, co-chairs of this OACC Minsk group, which is also chaired by the United States and France. So uh, it is Russia which which has to to, to generate the uh, the initiative for for political process that, there. This is the first thing. On the other hand, uh, let us not forget that Russia uh, has a, secu a security um, treaty with uh, Armenia, and it doesn't have security treaty with, with, with Azerbaijan. That's why there are certain obligations for for Russia. You see, and even uh, some. Uh, uh, hoax in Azerbaijan when, when they're speaking about uh, Armenia they're saying that look uh, we would have won the battle uh, uh, the, the, the war two decades uh, ago but uh, we lost not because we were facing mm, tiny Armenia but we were facing both uh, Armenia and Russia but having said that I also want to emphasize that Russia is not trying not to take side in this conflict because if it took if it has taken sides, then its role as a co-chairman of the OSC means group would be finished. That's why Russia also is uh, working quite actively on the Azeri diplomatic track. And uh, let me just remind our audience that uh, this week, meaning next week, uh, we, we are expecting a, a high-profile meeting of three foreign ministers of uh, Russia. Uh, Azerbaijan and Iran, and one of the issues which would be discussed would be Nagorno Karabakh. The announcement of, of, of the meeting, I want to emphasize this, came before the hostilities broke out. That it showed that Russia is also active All right. on Azeri okay, side. Okay, so, okay. We can talk. Uh, we can I talk think, more yeah. about the external yeah. actors in just a minute. But um, it's interesting that you raise the, the uh, prospect of other. Uh, parties taking part in the negotiations because, of course, Nagorno-Karabakh is not the only former Soviet territory to face this kind of political crisis. In 2008, you may remember, Russia and Georgia fought a week-long war over the region of South Ossetia, which is on the border between the two countries. Abkhazia was also part of that conflict. And it was the status of these two enclaves that took Russian forces into the sovereign territory of a neighbour, Georgia. And last year, Russia annexed Crimea, but the region is still internationally recognized as being part of Ukraine. Marcus, can I come to you and ask whether there are any parallels? This is, these are former Soviet uh, areas yeah. that are undergoing all sorts of, uh, all sorts of um, tumultuous uprisings for one reason or another. Is it an ethnic, uh, is this an ethnic conflict? Is this one of, of, um, of, of self-determination? I mean, how should we classify this particular conflict? Well, unfortunately, it didn't take long um, in this discussion uh, for Russia to be painted as the bad guy, to be demonized. You know, we need to understand the nature of the Caucasus, uh, the, the North Caucasus, which of course is in Russia, the South Caucasus, which of course is comprised of Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan, extremely volatile region, uh, a mosaic of different peoples, different religions and different cultures. Indeed, the great Russian poet Alexander Pushkin once wrote a poem in which he said, um, I know how to fight, I, I know how to use a dagger, I was born in the Caucasus. The reality is that Russia is a peacemaker in the Caucasus and it does not serve Russia's security interests for there to be a, a full-blown conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia. But it has military Why? interests, doesn't it, particularly in Armenia, with two bases there. That could spill into the North Caucasus and that could jeopardize the security of Chechnya, Dagestan and Ingushetia. So actually it is Russia that is playing um, a significant role acting as a guarantor for peace and security. You need to have a look outside of the region. You need to have a look at America. You need to have a look at Turkey, um, how they have been trying to draw Azerbaijan into their orbit ever since Azerbaijan became an independent uh, country at the end of 1991, beginning 1992. You know, Russia has legitimate national security interests. And unfortunately, uh, America and one of its closest friends and allies in the world, Turkey, does not respect that. But, you know, there has been, uh, there, there has not been a full-blown war this weekend between Armenia and Azerbaijan because Russia is a strong country today in 2016. And that is why there was a full-blown conflict in the early 1990s between Azer uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia because, of course, Russia was on its knees at that point. But today in 2016, Russia is back and it's very, very unlikely there will be a full-blown war between Azerbaijan and Armenia because of Russia's presence and influence 
in the Caucasus as a whole. So, Sergei, in Moscow, can I put that to you and uh, ask why then, given, uh, as Marcus suggests, that Russia is an honest broker in this and is actually a, a, a guarantor of security in the region, why then has the Minsk pro process pretty much ended in stalemate? It's not going anywhere, so much so that the Iranians are offering to, p to pick up the baton and to take on this mediation process. Well, I don't think that it is fair just to, 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 to put the blame on Russia for uh, what we, the mess what we have seen in, in the, this Minsk process in the last uh, two decades. Uh, let me just remind you that Russia, yes, you are right, Russia is one of the, uh, one of the chairmen, but apart from that, there are also uh, United States there, there are also France. Each country has its own probably hidden agenda, its own na national interests, and when you have such a three three uh, chairman, chairman, co-chairmen of, of the treaty, and uh, each has its own uh, interest, group of interests, and uh, you know how active is uh, Armenian lobby in the uh, United States and in, in France, then you'll see that it, not everything depends on Russia. So I don't think it's fair to, to say that this is the Ru Ru Russia's uh, failure, fault, why the Minsk group is not working. But I think that President Aliyev really has a point when in recent uh, weeks more than once he said that we are fed up with this means group uh, in action in ability to resolve the issue he was also recalling the episode why how three years back the new uh, the, the new co-chair on american side mr warmick came to to baku that was in 2013 and he was saying that we have to give a new impetus to the resolution so three years passed and we uh, uh, baku sees no no any change no any progress and uh, President Aliyev obviously comes under the pressure of domestic situation, uh, political elite, uh, business elite, military elite is looking at him and saying, do something, do something. How long will it, we will tolerate the situation? So it's a sort of a, a lot of overlapping issues with the agenda of global powers, regional powers and domestic situation in Azerbaijan uh, turn into a sort of a Gordian knot. And it's it's uh, so difficult to cut it so far so far there's no way to do that okay uh, daniel as we've already mentioned this minsk process this has been much maligned uh, in this program and beyond um comes under the aegis or the auspices of the osce uh, obviously that's a european security and cooperation organization what about the eu where is the eu in this and could the eu bring some pressure to bear to resolve this situation and remove this potential for conflict in the heart of europe I think the answer is basically is yes. I think the, the Minsk group has tried its best over the years, but it is now so mired in vested interests. You know, you have Russia as one of the chairman of the Minsk group countries, one of the people who are supposed to be resolving this conflict, whilst at the same time selling arms to both parties, which is clearly an unacceptable situation for any conflict resolution process. What we actually need to have now is an honest broker to come to the region, to sit down with Armenia, with Azerbaijan, but also with the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, who throughout this process have been largely overlooked. Because whilst this is largely seen as a negotiation which has gone on between Baku and Yerevan, with some external involvement from other parties, there's been very little communication on the ground with the people of Nagorno-Karabakh in relation to their own aspirations and their own concerns. Well, indeed, they're not invited. They're not invited, are they? To the process. Precisely. They're excluded Precisely. both on the government level and on the civil society level. You, you, are, you are entirely correct, which is why I fully agree. It's time to have a brand new model for resolving this conflict. We need to potentially look at the European Union providing a model for that, an honest broker, someone who can bring the two parties together and reinstall both some momentum and some mutual respect to these discussions. Because at the moment, all we have is a 20-year-old outdated mechanism which has achieved absolutely nothing other than to prolong stalemate, to hold back the region and to perpetuate conflicts like we've seen in the last few days. And Marcus, can I ask you again, what is the essence of the conflict? Is it uh, a matter of self-determination for, what, 140,000 people, mostly Armenians, or is it uh, a matter, is this an ethnic issue where Armenians want uh, this patch of land, this mountainous enclave, as we've uh, already described it as, um, and they want to join up with uh, Greater Armenia? 
Well, you know, many Western commentators will, uh, will refer to 1988 when the people of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, voted overwhelmingly to secede from what was then the Azerbaijan Soviet Socialist Republic. But of course, um, the origins go, far, uh, go further back than that. It's really 1918. You know, following the, uh, the February and October revolutions in Russia, um, Muslim nationalist organizations in Azerbaijan saw, saw an opportunity um, to create an independent Azerbaijan, which had never existed before. Um, but at that point, Baku was dominated by Russians, Armenians and Jews. So there's very little they could do. But the Turkish army intervened. They took over Baku. And of course, the Azerbaijanis committed a horrendous slaughter in Baku. They massacred something like 30,000 Armenians in cold blood. Um, that is really the roots. OK, of this, uh, of so, this so, so Marcus, um, Marcus points out the, the, the rather bitter and traumatic history of this enclave. Sergei and Daniel are suggesting that perhaps the EU um, is the body, the organisation that could intervene with uh, positive results. Where, from where you're sitting, do you think the most positive intervention could come in terms of moving this conflict forward so as to, to um, remove the possibility of this kind of skirmish happening again and of course it getting even worse well uh, uh, so far uh, I, I don't see that uh, European Un Union can, can can play a major role in, in the resolve of this issue I am struggling to recall if we just take the recent years a single case where European Union was just uh, intervening effectively in uh, a resolution of uh, the conflict so let me recall that uh, during the August uh, war of 2008 in Georgia it was not the European Union but uh, President Francois Hollande who, who, who intervened but on his capacity not, not in the position as a representative of the European Union as a president of France but I think that what should be done really and uh, this is actually once again emphasized by the uh, recent outbreak of hostilities in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh Nagorno is that Minsk process needs a uh, reset uh, because now it is defunct so it should be revamped uh, and uh, it should get a, a new momentum new steam which it is currently lacking this is how i see it okay and marcus where can this new steam this new momentum come from well, in my opinion, the European Union will not be received well in Baku because in the last few months, uh, the European Parliament has been urging the European Council to place sanctions on uh, Azerbaijan for alleged human rights uh, breaches. And that's why Azerbaijan uh, last year and this year has been uh, growing ever closer um, to Russia. So in my opinion, the European Union doesn't have a role to play. It certainly didn't have a role to play in Ukraine. In fact, it played an, an important role in the crisis in Ukraine when an independent sovereign government uh, in Kiev was, uh, was overthrown. But in my opinion, Russia, Armenia and Azerbaijan have to sit down together. They are part of um, a, a very historical family, oh, both in the Zionist right. era let and me, the... Let me quickly bring Daniel in. We have a minute left. Let me quickly bring Daniel in. I can see that you're disagreeing with Marcus. Uh, the suggestion that the, that, that the European Union played a role in some kind of coup or putsch in Ukraine is, is frankly preposterous. Yanukovych was removed from office All right, via but can a democratic we concentrate on the issue today, please? The can can we in, concentrate in, in, quickly in, on the issue today? Precisely. When we look at when we look at Nagorno when we look at Nagorno Karabakh, when we look at Nagorno Karabakh, we see the most important thing that needs to be done on the ground is for there to be an honest broker in the region. Is the European Union a perfect solution? No. But the European Union is the only institution which there is that actually embodies human rights values and democracy. The European Union has ongoing and regular dialogue with both Yerevan and Baku, despite whatever bumps in the road there is. And frankly, the European Union is the model by which there can be conflict resolution in this case, rather than turning to a failed process which puts at the negotiating table a power like Russia, which perpetuates this conflict for their own purposes. OK. Gentlemen, at this point, I have to say thank you very much indeed. Our time is up. Daniel Hamilton, Sergei Struken and Marcus Papadopoulos, thank you all very much indeed. And, of course, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by going to the website, aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And there's always the Twitter sphere. Join the conversation. Our handle at AJ Inside Story from me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team here. It's bye for now.